Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone. So, hope you're doing well. This is our last class uh, of the semester. Okay, so thanks for sticking with me. Um, I appreciate it. So, um, I don't know. I want to say we might end it like five minutes early, but usually I fatly overestimate how quickly I can cover things. So that may or may not be true, but we'll see. Um, so uh, hope, hope things are going well with the projects. Okay, I actually just, just like an hour ago or so, uh, posted the, uh, the grades for the, the last project, uh, the country level project. Okay, so I think I think everyone did quite well. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have in store for the next one. Okay. Um, so, you know, just, just let me know if you got any questions on that. All right. Uh, I guess, so, so today, um, I'm going to kind of finish off what we were talking about last time, uh, with regards to kind of these endogenous growth models. Okay. Um, uh, and then, you know, provide some sort of intuition for that Romer model. Okay. So we, we had to rush a little bit at the end. Okay. Or maybe a lot at the end, uh, to get into sort of that final outcome. All right. Um, so provide some intuition for that. And then I'll also talk a little bit about, um, the, the, uh, so the other major type of endogenous growth model that's kind of out there, uh, or framework in which people think about these things, which is more of a Schumpeterian style model. Okay. So, uh, they're kind of related, okay. Um, but the Schumpeterian model has is a little bit more realistic in the sense that it it features some of the types of competition that we think about as I think quite relevant today, and but also historically, and it ties in with um, some of that stuff in why nations fail about contestability and disruption and competition. Okay, so um, but let's yeah. So so we'll do a quick quick uh, couple things on the on the Romer model, and then we can we can move on from there. Okay, so I'm going to not use a regular pencil to draw on my iPad because that would be very costly. Um, uh, so, uh, Roman model. So, so at the end, let me actually go over the iPad so you can see that. So at the end, we kind of, <clears throat> we arrived eventually, after a great deal of struggling, uh, uh, at something like this. Okay, so what is that? That's saying... Um, you know, so, so remember, uh, in, in the Roman model, sort of our, our, our labor market situation is basically we have a bunch of people out there. We're going to call them P. I know that's, it looks like a price, but it's not, it's a population. Okay. Uh, it's a number. Okay. And then they're either going to be, uh, or actually, cause yeah. Okay. Uh, they're either going to be doing production, which I'm going to call L or um, research, which is R. Okay. Uh, if I could go back and change it, I might flip P and L so that I can say L is labor, P is production and R is research. That would make more sense. But as you can see, I've already sort of committed to L as being production. Okay. So we're kind of stuck with that. Okay. But, um, nonetheless, uh, that's the situation. So you got a total number of people and, and basically what you, the big decision you need to make is how many people are going to do production work and how many people are going to do research work. Okay. Um, the Romer model provides kind of a prediction for that. Okay. And that's the thing on the right, which is R over P. So R, the number of research workers divided by the total number of uh, people in the population. This is the research, research share. Okay. This is the big important uh, thing that society is determining. Okay. And it's going to determine how much you're producing today and through the research share, how much your uh, product productivity is going to be growing in the future endogenously through research. Um, and so those two things combined, I mean, that's your intertemporal trade-off uh, decision. Um, and those two things combined will determine your welfare, like your, your, the present value of your welfare. Okay. Because you know, think about um, the way we usually have been talking about welfare, um, like in, in beyond GDP, especially it was kind of a, a today welfare. It's like, what's the, the, the current experience like, okay. Um, it wasn't really a forward looking notion of welfare. Okay. Which, which definitely has its limitations. Okay. And some of you, uh, noted that right in, in your, you know, um, in discussions or 
in your projects about this consumption share, right? So what does a consumption share mean? Well, you know, it, it, there's a sense in which you, you, you're you producing X amount, but you're only consuming a certain fraction of that, okay? It's not like you're throwing away the rest, you're, you're investing the rest, which which often is a prudent thing to do, okay? So, um, but if you, you know, if you just look at that slice of time today, you know, you're, you're only consuming that fraction. So that's your, your sort of your, your welfare just for today. Okay. Um, but you know, in general, you know, we also want to think about a, a notion of a sort of a, the present value welfare. Okay. So if, if you think about, you know, this, uh, financial accounting or stuff we've been doing with the firms here in this model, you know, you have your, your profit today and then you have the present value. So it's the difference between your profit this year, you know, uh, uh, and your, you know, your, your, whatever your quarterly statements or whatever, or your yearly statements, uh, and the value of, say of the stock, which is like the present value notion. Okay. So, um, you know, when, so, so when we're thinking about L and R, you know, it's, you know, L kind of determines how much you're producing today. Okay. And that's going to ter determine sort of your, your, your flow of welfare today, uh, uh through utility. Um, and then R is determining how are things growing in the future, which is going to determine the path of productivity and hence the path of your consumption in the future, your production and consumption in the future. So, so, you know, a true welfare, like a metric would, would incorporate both of those, you know, you get your utility today, but you also have this notion that things are going to be growing in the future. Okay. And that's how you, that's how you get this trade off between production today, P or L rather, and, and research and hence uh, productivity growth in the future. Okay. So, so, you know, it's important to remember that's what's going on here. Okay. That's something that's kind of missing, even though beyond GDP did incorporate a bunch of new stuff over and above GDP. Uh, it does, you know, it still kind of is missing that, um, <clears throat> that notion of, of forward looking welfare. Okay. Um, I guess you could, you could do that. I mean, you could, think about that in certain ways, right? Um, so so I think that the typical way to think about it is, okay, well, if you look at GDP, right? I mean, uh, in a simple simple world, let's say no trade or anything like that, it's gonna, you're, you're, and no trade, no government, which is very simple world. Uh, you know, you're either consuming it or you're investing it, okay? Um, you might think, okay, well, people, you know, people are investing for a reason, okay? So, so you know, kind of on the margin, the, the the value of that those investment goods should be equal to sort of the expected value that they they, they anticipate they will generate from that investment okay um, and so so just using regular GDP actually is is in some sense better than just looking at consumption right because you're saying okay well people are consuming a certain amount they're investing but that investment happened for a reason and hence we should just look at GDP that's a reasonable argument okay um, it assumes that the investment is undertaken sort of efficiently and, 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 and rationally in a sense. Okay. Which isn't always the case. Um, especially when, when you have people making decisions about those investments that aren't sort of like really involved in them. Okay. Uh, you know, they, or they're not knowledgeable about it. Okay. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, so, but, 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 so, so that's one argument for just using GDP, but you could also imagine saying, okay, well, um, let's instead, you know, we could look at welfare over many years and appropriately kind of discount that stuff, right. And see, and see how that plays out. Right. So imagine you had, you, you know, we do, we have the world tables. You could look and say, okay, well, what was welfare in 1950? Okay. It was a look at, you know, um, consumption in 1950 and then in 51 and discount that by a little bit, like 5% and 52 and discount that by a bit more and just keep adding that up. Okay. And you can say, well, that was like the realized welfare from the perspective of 1950. Okay. That's a valid thing to do. Uh, that's hard to do today because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right. But, but if you want to do a retrospective analysis, you actually could do that. Okay. <clears throat> and it's kind of like, it's, it's just like stock valuation because with stock valuation, you know, you have, you could look at the price 10 years ago, and then look at uh, the realized profits and dividends over the next 10 years and kind of discount all that stuff by, by the appropriate discount rate with, the, with your with your bond math, you know, one over one plus R uh, and, uh, and get a number, right? So you get two numbers. You get one number, what actually happened. Okay, that discounted 
stream of profits that actually was realized. And then you got another number, which is what, what was the value of the stock at that point in time, which is really what did people think would happen? Okay. But of course, those are not always the same. People, people think stuff's going to happen, then it doesn't, or vice versa. So um, these are just two approaches to, to, to doing this kind of valuation. Okay. So uh, yeah, I don't like the aside, but, but you know, I, I do want to, because we didn't talk about it so much in the GDP side or in, in the beyond GDP side, even, I did want to just sort of explicitly mention, you know, th this intertemporal component. Okay. Um, all right. So then how does that relate to, to, to us here? Okay. Well, this, this is what the, the labor trade-off is, is exemplifying is, is that intertemporal trade-off. Okay. And, and the outcome, the final outcome, all that work that we did for the Roman model basically boils down to this SR star thing. So it's the, what's the equilibrium fraction of research that's actually going on? How many people are doing research? Okay. And you get this number. Okay. So you get this expression, this is alpha N over rho plus alpha N. Okay. So remember, what did we find? And so N is the population growth rate, right? And, and, uh, the first thing we found, which is over here on the left, in the ideas production section is that we're, we're in a, if you think back to the Jones taxonomy, we're in a phi equals one, sorry. Um, so we're, we're in a phi equals zero world actually, because this a dot here, it doesn't depend on a. So it's actually, you, you know, you produce, uh, new goods. Okay. Um, and it doesn't use existing technology. It's kind of like it's just out there. Okay. Um, and what you get in that case, okay. So remember in, in the general Jones world, we found that you should, you should expect to get, uh, a growth rate of N times eta over one minus five. Okay. That was a while ago, but that's what we found. Um, and in our case, we have eight equals one because eta is the exponent on R that determines the, the, you have increasing returns of scale like decreasing or constant returns of scale in your research production function. Okay. I remember it might be that research doesn't scale up linearly. Okay. What this is saying is that it does the N equals one, you have a linear production function. Okay. That's that gamma R that's a linear production function. Uh, and that's also saying phi equals zero is that a does not enter into a dot. It's not like having better technology today makes future technology much easier to produce. Okay. It's just kind of like, you're just out there thinking of ideas and, and you, it's not super technologically um, intensive to produce them. Okay. Uh, so, so the general equation is n times eta over minus phi. In our case, we have n eta equals one and phi equals zero, which means that it's just n. Okay. Another way to think about it is to look at this second equation here that I'm going to star. Okay. Also use my, my pointer and point to it uh, over here. Uh, sorry, I have like 60 different pointers going on here, but, but this equation, um, you know, this is going to say uh, that, you know, if you want to have a constant growth rate, then R, your number of researchers, which is going to be proportional to your population, should be growing at the same rate as technology A. Right. So, so that, what that means is G equals N, the growth rate of technology is equal to the growth rate of the population. Okay. Um, okay. So that's, that's number one. We, we found that the, we, we basically, we, we argued or we found that the growth rate of, of technology should, should be equal to the growth rate of the population because of this assumption that we made. Okay. Um, and it's interesting to think about just as a little aside here, uh, to think about this production function and the, that, especially that 80 equals one assumption that I was talking about, you know, does, can you just scale up research? And if you double the number of researchers overnight, are you going to double your, your production of new ideas? Okay. There's, there's reason to think that maybe you can't, because it might be that those researchers aren't communicating enough. They're duplicating each other's work. Okay. Because they're not constantly checking what each of each team is doing. Um, and so you might think that because there's, they're going to do duplicative research, the total output, right, which is really the number of unique ideas that you come up with, okay, is going to be less than two times if you double the team size. Okay, so that's the argument in a, in a research space about why you would expect constant returns. You know, if you look at out, uh, out in the real world, you know, I mean, it, one really interesting place to look at this is, of course, with the COVID vaccines, right? That's like a huge very urgent research undertaking. And we said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do this, right? Um, 
then we did it. That was great. Um, uh, and you know, we were talking the other day about you know, did, were we lucky or not? I mean, I don't know. Maybe we were a little lucky having the mRNA just kind of out there uh, as an option. Okay. Um, but if you look at the the how it worked, you know, you had that that dynamic where you had these different teams. You know, you had Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson. You know, uh, Sinovac, the Russian one. I forget what it's called. Um, you know, a bunch of different teams, and they were probably were doing some, you know, common duplicative research. Maybe they were communicating too, but there was probably some duplicative research going on there. At the end of the day, you need what we wanted was a vaccine that worked. We ended up getting multiple ones that worked, but you know, that's better that diversifies their risk a little bit. What we wanted was a vaccine that worked. So, so there, we achieved the goal, right? Certainly. Um, uh, and um, we we put in. A lot of effort, I think, justifiably. Okay, but it's interesting to see how you know that provides a little bit of a window into these production functions and and what happens. You know, and you learn the most about this stuff when you really go outside of the normal bounds of operation. This is an exceptional event, and and in that sense, we learn the most in those you know kind of events because we're not just going along doing what we always do. We're actually pushing the boundaries and saying, okay, what what if we what if we did this? Okay, so it's it's really interesting. To look at that kind of stuff because because you learn the most in those types of situations. Okay, um, okay. So that was an aside on sort of research and, and and returns to scale and how that works. Okay, but okay. So we found, oops, uh, we found that G equals n. The growth rate of, of technology is going to be equal to that of population. Okay, uh, which is you know, G. Another way to say it is G A, which is equal to G, is equal to G uh, P. I guess in this case, which is equal to and the growth rate of population is growth rate of technology A. Okay. Um, all right. So that's N. Let's say N, N is the growth rate of population. Let's say it's 2%. That's not so bad. All right. Um, and then if you go back to this SR equation. Okay. So we, we, we talked about N. Okay. Alpha. Alpha is a good friend of ours. We go way back. Right. Alpha, let's say it's 35%. That's our capital share or one minus our labor share maybe is the best way to say it. Because remember, in this world, you got labor, which is one minus alpha. Then you got profits are alpha squared, and then capital is actually alpha one minus alpha. So, which they all sum to one, but it's a slightly different decomposition. So that's why people like to think about it as one minus the labor share, because the labor share is not going anywhere. All right, um, and, and the labor share is relatively easy to measure. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, and so one moment here. Uh, yeah, so so that's alpha. We're 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 all good on that, I think. Um, and then rho is is uh, is our rate of time discounting, a pure rate of time discounting. Okay, so um, that's that's how much you that's how much you discount the future. Okay, and that's um, it's not exactly the interest rate, right? So there's an interest rate. The interest rate is 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 how much you can borrow and lend money at, in the purest sense. Okay. Um, in this type of model, it also happens to be equal to how much how much it costs to rent capital, because um, in 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 general, assets you know are, are claims to capital. They represent physical capital, uh, and so their their rental rate is going to be kind of equal or at least related to the their their financial return. Okay, because you can own the asset and rent it out, and that's your financial return. Okay, so um, yeah, so so that's the interest rate. Okay. And then, the, but the row is your is is that's what it that's what's inside people's utility functions. Okay, that's how people actually evaluate streams of consumption, right? So you have your utility function with like UFC, which we're going to usually assume is is log, log, logarithmic. Okay, I guess I haven't um, I haven't talked about it explicitly, but we're going to assume kind of that it's logarithmic. Um, and uh, yeah, but then you have also your discount rate. How much you discount the future? How much are you willing to trade off? consumption today versus tomorrow. And that's really important in making those types of decisions that I was talking about with regards to producing today versus doing research. And so producing less today, but more tomorrow or vice versa. Rho tells you how you, how you um, evaluate those things. Okay, so like, just as an example, like let's say your utility was logarithmic, then you're sort of your whole utility function, how you evaluate streams of consumption would look like this, okay? That is a zero, but it looked kind of like a degree sign, so I couldn't take it. Um, so it's going to be basically log of 
c of t. So, so c of t is a function. It's saying at time zero, I get you know consumption of 10. And let's say that that grows exponentially over time. And so that's going to be, you know, as, as time goes on, I'm going to consume more and more, maybe because productivity and the technology is improving and society is getting more, well, I don't know, it's improving and we're consuming more. Um, and, then, and off to infinity, okay? So we're infinite horizon, okay? So the, that's your utility, like today, your, your, your full utility. Um, and then, um, but you discount it, okay? So you discount the future. And that's where you get the second term, which is your discounting term. Uh, and so, you, you know, you, you, so, so as time goes on, you weight that stuff in the future from the perspective of today, less and less. And that, and that generally we assume that's exponential. There's good reasons for that, but we assume it's exponential. Okay. So today you value stuff like at one, when T equals zero, which that thing is just a one as T gets large, that thing's going to fall off. Okay. What that means is that, you know, if you have, uh, let's see. If, if you're thinking sitting here today and your discount rate's 5% and you're considering, oh, well, how, how much do I care about consumption that happens in, in 50 years? Well, the answer is really not that much. Okay. Cause it's, it's exponentially discounted fairly severely actually. So, um, now, and, and, and then in this world you, you live forever. Okay. So you don't die. So you could even ask the question, how much do I care about consumption in a thousand years? You know, you're, you're like Dracula or something. Uh, well, you wouldn't care at all basically. Okay, because of the discounting. So I don't know what Dracula's discount rate is, but all right, the match is fairly low. He's, he's like patient kind of fell off. Okay, so, um, but you know, this is how you do it. Okay, and so rho is is critical, and and rho enters into these types of calculations. Okay, so one of the big places rho, like, kind of, in academic and policy debates, shows up is in climate uh, analyses and debates. Okay, because. If you want to think about what's the value of, of taking a certain climate mitigation or uh, adaptation measure, okay, um, I mean, usually those take the form of something like you need to make a little bit of a sacrifice today, and in exchange, you um, you, know, you have less maybe production in the immediate sense, uh, but you reduce carbon emissions and hence the the path of the carbon stock kind of bent downwards a little bit. I guess I should do it. bent downwards a little bit instead of you know, going up exponentially, maybe we flatten it out, okay? Uh, and as a result, the path of temperature also bent downwards into maybe a more manageable zone, okay? Um, and hence, less uh, climactic impacts, lower probability of climactic disasters and other things like that, okay? So um, that's the type of trade-off that you know, you can bring up a little bit of production today in exchange for maybe averting these, these fairly severe uh, outcomes in the future, okay? Uh, and, 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 you know, when those outcomes happen, they're also going to impact production. Okay. So you could think about it purely in production terms, but also just in utility terms, it kind of sucks to have a, a climate that goes, goes under. Right. So, um, so that, just, you know, as a result, you know, the, of those types of trade-offs, which are these intertemporal trade-offs, you know, bro, is important in thinking, okay, is it worth it to set a carbon tax of a hundred percent or 10% or 50%? Is it worth it to allocate more money to, uh, research in clean technology. Okay. Uh, is it worth it to, I don't know. I saw a news article. Is it worth it to pay Brazil to not cut down the rainforest because they could otherwise do that and probably make money and they're, they're not a rich country compared to the U S. Um, so is it, is it worth it to just kind of pay them to not do that? Right. So, um, say from the perspective of the U S right. So, uh, that row shows up a lot and people get into big arguments about what row should be. Should it be 5%? Should it be 2%? Should it be 0%? Some of the philosophers say it should be 0%. The problem with 0% is that this integral wouldn't work if, if you had a zero. Uh, and so that's the math kind of blows up, but that's not the philosopher's problem. That's the economist's problem. They, I guess we're just supposed to deal with that. Okay. So um, yeah, uh, you know, so Rose important is what I'm saying. All right. Um, here I had it 5%, 5% is maybe a little, that's a little short-sighted, I think. Um, and now the other thing about rho is that, well, okay, what is, is rho just a single number? Well, no, because, you know, everyone's different. People are more, different people are more or less patient. So probably every person's got their own rho. If you even, in, in reality, you know, people are more complicated than a simple utility function, but everyone's got sort of a, an approximate rho, say, uh, and, and, you know, some people are more or less patient. Okay. But also you might be more or less patient 
in different contexts, even within one person. So, you know, it's, the world's complicated, but, um, you know, so, so, th so this is all an approximation, but, um, the, you could try and, and kind of like measure row. You know, you could just like we measured stuff before with, with ADA and beyond GDP and, and things like that. You just, you, you look at what people do and try to infer row. So you say, Hey, uh, if you give me a dollar now, I'll give you $10, you know, in a week, right? If, if someone takes that, well, I'd probably take it, right? If they don't take it, that's a sign that they're they're pretty impatient, right? Or they're like financially constrained, right? So um, you, you give people kind of options, you give them a little different menu of options, you kind of infer what their row is. And that's what experimental economists do sometimes, okay? Um, yeah, so so you can you could experimentally try to measure row too. Okay, people have done that, right? So so it's probably it's somewhere between two and five percent, let's say. All right. Um, okay. So now having said all that, we have an idea maybe of of where these numbers lie. Okay. So if you put in, I I just calculated if you put in, uh, you know, two percent for the population growth, five percent for the the rate of time, pure rate of time preference. That's like the the official name for row, uh, and and thirty five percent for alpha. Then you get SR of about 10%. Okay, now that's it's a little high. If you look at the number of people employed that are like officially classified as researchers, it's more like 0.5%. So that's 20 times too large. Okay, so, you know, uh, maybe not great. Okay, um, and if you went down to row of 2%, meaning you're more patient, you would do more research, right? So if you went down to a row of 2%, you would... Um, well, you'd get a third over four thirds, which is a quarter, so 25%, um, which is huge. Okay, so let's stick with row equals 5% for now. Um, but but 10%, uh, okay, well, you know, you can you can fudge it a little bit. You can say, okay, well, okay, not just literally people who have researcher in their title, let's include engineers, okay? Let's include um, writers, musicians, YouTubers, Twitch streamers, anyone creating new stuff, okay? Well, maybe you could, you could get up closer to ten percent, probably not quite to ten percent, but you could probably get, get there. Okay, so uh, the five percent maybe. Okay, so then um, yeah, that's a, that's an idea, uh, uh, and 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 so uh, that that's sort of the big outcome. All right, I would say he does okay. All right, it wasn't like eighty percent. That's that's a good step. Okay, that we got. It wasn't just like obviously completely wrong. It's a little high, but it's it's not the worst. Okay. Um, and some of it depends on how you define this stuff, okay? Um, all right, so then, okay, so so what can we do from here? Well, there's a question of, you know, is this efficient? You know, we haven't really talked about it, but, you know, this, this is an equilibrium out. This isn't saying anything about efficiency necessarily, okay? Now, oftentimes in economics, we entertain or write down models where things are efficient, you know, because there's, there's no externalities, you know, people are internalizing the, the consequences of their actions, uh, their, or their actions only affect themselves, and hence they're they are automatically internalizing them, the rational forward looking, all that stuff. That usually leads to efficient outcomes. But, you know, we, we are in the space of ideas here, and there's there's a lot of interaction, and, and there's this non-excludability stuff, which makes, the, that means that there's some scope for inefficiency, okay? Um, and so, so one thing you can do is sort of a, a marginal benefit, marginal cost type analysis to try and figure out is, is this efficient? Okay. And, and the general approach here is, okay, well, you've got in, in, okay. So, so, so here's what we do. We have the equilibrium outcome. We've already solved for that just right up here. Okay. Now we can think about what would a social planner do? Okay. So the social planner is like a, your imaginary friend in economics who, who can control all production decisions, um, and they do so rationally, and they do so uh, uh, taking into account um, people's utility function. Okay. Now in this world, we're going to assume that everyone's the same. They have a you know say like a like utility, the discount rate row. Okay. So so they but but the social planner internalizes all externalities um, benevolently and so on. Okay. So. So we can think about that. So we can, and we can think about, you know, uh, so, so we can think about the, what I'm going to call the private marginal benefit. Okay. Versus private marginal cost. Okay. And then we can think about social marginal benefit versus social marginal cost. 
Okay, so the equilibrium and the equilibrium essentially that's what this is what the equilibrium is finding. It's thinking it's saying okay, for a given firm, they're saying okay, well I can I can invest in research, uh, and to do so I need to uh, to do if I do so I have some probability of success, and if I succeed, I become a firm like a real firm, and uh, I produce and I get profits and I value that somehow. Okay, uh, that's the that's the private marginal benefit, and the, the cost is that I have to pay this researcher a wage W. Okay, so the in in the equilibrium setting, the the sort of entrant firms, the researcher firms, are making this this PMB versus PMC decision, and they're they're, they're presumably they're equating them. Okay, that's that's like you, you do the thing until the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost, and then you stop doing it as much. Or you, you like stay where you are. Okay, so um, that's what the private entities research firms are doing. Now, the social planner, I mean, well, they're just, they, they, they just choose R. They say, okay, like you're going to be researchers. So you go over there and research. Everyone else here producers, you go over there and produce. Okay. Um, but they're going to do so in such a way, again, that they, they, they will equate the social marginal benefit and the social marginal cost. Okay. So that's what the social planner is doing. Okay. All right. So then um, that's the plan. Okay. So, so we're going to figure out what each of those four things are and kind of see what they look like. Okay, so I need some. I need a new page. Uh, we're gonna get a new page. Okay, so but um, so let's let's do the uh, private calculation. I guess um, you know, the private marginal benefit versus marginal cost. Okay, calculation. Um. Okay, so so here's we we already basically did it. It's the good part. Okay, so so it's, 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 this is all kind of just review. Okay, um, now, okay, so so but yeah, so so what what is what is the what is this calculation? Okay, so remember I said that you know for a marginal benefit, you hire a researcher, and the researchers are are successful with probability gamma at generating a new idea. So you hire one researcher, and they have some sort of flow probability gamma of, of being successful. Okay, uh, and then um, if they are successful, you get that value v, which we had defined. I'll talk about that, what that looks like. Okay, um, and then the marginal cost, private marginal cost is w. Okay, so this is private marginal benefit is equal to gamma v. Private marginal cost is equal to oh dear, what is that thing? I don't know what that thing is. Or I want it to go away. Okay, is equal to private marginal cost. Right. So marginal benefit on the left, marginal cost on the right. Okay, and so, and then uh, you know we can we can start sort of iteratively sub in stuff. Okay, so we know what v looks like. In fact, all right, v is gonna. Um, well, okay, let's see. Yeah, so so, you know, there, there's a little bit of. We did a little bit of analysis behind this, but basically, what you do is you, to to find v. Okay, we're just gonna um, take the profits. That's how much profit you're making like a yearly basis and just divide by the discount rate. Okay. And that'll get, get us up to like a present value. Okay. So if the discount rate is 5%, then, you know, the, the value is, is 20 times the profit. Okay. So that, that's like that P ratio stuff I was talking about on Tuesday. All right. So that's, that's going to be our benefit. And then the, the cost is, let's just leave that as W for now. Okay. So I, I'm going to leave it like this because here, wait, this is actually kind of, kind of an interesting place to to leave things okay because um this this is kind of like our uh you know we've been talking about like sort of like the labor share the profit share and stuff like that so these are two like important shares in gdp how you know how much of gdp is going to profit and how much is going to production labor okay um and that split between sort of you know what's going to profits, what's going to production labor, is what's mediating this this um, this outcome in equilibrium. Okay, so remember, I'm pulling this from the slides. We we found, okay, I'll do it over here. We found that that share. Okay, basically a times pi, the total number of profits. Okay, it's going to be alpha times one minus alpha times y. Okay, so remember there's a different um, intermediate firms making these goods okay and each of them makes pi so the total amount of profits is a times pi 
that's some fraction alpha times one minus alpha of total output, which is y. Okay, so that's your profit share. And then we also found the, the production labor share, WL, was, uh, it was one, one minus alpha times y. Okay. So, uh, well, those look pretty similar, and you can, you know, um, but but we can use those and plug them in over on the left, okay, and, and kind of reveal a little bit more about what this this private marginal benefit marginal cost calculation is going to look like. All right. So, uh, yeah. So let's do that. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna have gamma. Let's see, gamma over rho here, and then pi. Okay, is going to be alpha one minus alpha times y. And then divided by a. So we move move that a over when we plug it in. Same thing with w. It's going to be one minus alpha times y over l. Okay, we just solve for w. Okay. All right. And so um, yeah. Okay. So so now from here, all right, well, first of all, you can see that uh, some things. Cancel. So the one minus alpha and the y are both going to cancel. Okay, so that makes our life a little bit easier. Let's, let's, so we're going to get alpha, gamma over rho, and then a, a one minus a here, one over a here, on the left, and then just a one over l on the right. Okay, that, that's actually pretty simple. Okay, um, and then the other thing we're going to need. Okay, is is we we we, we kind of don't want to have a, but we know that a and r are going to be kind of related. So remember that a dot is equal to gamma r. Okay, this is kind of a tricky point, but but it's it's kind of the only way we have, and that means that the growth rate, which is a dot over a, is gamma r over a. Okay, and then remember that growth rate is equal to also equal to n. Right, because because if the growth rate is to be constant, then the g g, which is the growth rate of a, has to be equal to n, which is the growth rate of r. So g g equals n, which is equal to all this stuff. Okay, if you and and so so what that means, finally, is that you know if you just solve for one over a, one over a is going to be you know n over gamma r. Okay, so so we're gonna use that fact over here. On the left to, to sub in for one over a, and so so one over a is is n over gamma r. Those gammas will cancel, so then we're going to get you know alpha times n over rho times r. Okay. Right, so we plug in n over gamma r, so we get that n over r. The gammas cancel, and so we get alpha n over rho. All right, and then on the right hand side we have l, and that's actually equal to P minus R. So, so the it's one over L, right? And so then the amount of production labor is just the total amount of labor minus the amount of research labor. Okay. All right. So th these are kind of the steps that we were doing before to find the equilibrium. Let's go and go through them again. Okay. Um, and then the last thing you can do is you, you know we have things in terms of <clears throat> R. And P, but we, we we would really rather think about them in terms of SR, right? So remember, you know, SR is R over P. Okay. So if we if we just kind of multi, on the left hand side, if we just multiply everything by P, you know, we're gonna end up with alpha n over rho SR here, and then one over one minus SR. Okay. Because everything kind of you know on the right hand side, you know. You, you can cancel this that divided by p that's going to turn it into a one this will turn into r over p which is sr and then over here this will turn into r over p which is sr okay so so we can just kind of cancel that across the board okay and so from here you know this is this is really what we're looking at. so this is private marginal benefit private marginal cost okay so that, that's kind of what we were looking for right and in the following sense is that you can plot these Okay, so think about plotting SR here. Okay, and remember SR is a share of researchers, so that goes between zero and one. Okay, um, it can't go above one. A little border there. Okay, and we can just plot those. Okay, so so you know, 
if you plot the the you know, so we're gonna plot you know marginal benefit PMB PMC we're gonna plot both of those if you if you do the left hand side the marginal benefit right at, you know as, as if that's at zero that thing is infinite basically and as SR gets larger then it, it goes down like this okay you know you know you'll just keep going down to zero even if you go past one although you can't um and then that's so that's private marginal benefit okay and then the marginal cost is increasing so at zero it's equal to one and it's going to look something like this okay it'll, it'll sort of asymptote up there okay um all right and so then there's going to be some intersection that's our equilibrium okay okay so then uh yeah so that so you get you, there's a unique intersection because one curve is increasing, the other curve is decreasing. Okay, there's always some some positive uh, intersection between zero and one. Okay, um, and and essentially, you know, if you want to think about what's the the intuition here, well, so think about the cost as a function of SR. The cost is is the wage. Okay, but essentially, as as SR gets closer to one. The, your research share gets closer to one, your production share is going to zero. Okay? And if your production share is going to zero, you're not producing anything. You know, you're, the, the marginal, um, uh, you're, you know, going down to zero production is very bad. Okay? Because people have log utility. If you, if you go down to zero, log goes to minus infinity. Right? So if, if you go down to zero production, things are really bad. And it gets really costly to, to produce less the lower you go down. Okay? Because you need a basic level to survive, right? So, so that's what's happening here. You don't want to go too high up, okay? And and this will prevent you from doing so as that marginal cost goes to infinity, okay? Um, now the the benefit, okay, this is the private benefit, okay? Uh, well, you know, they're going to be getting some profits, okay? Um, and and basically, you know, if 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 more people do research, okay, you're kind of the total amount of profits, the, the profit share is sort of fixed. So if more people do research, that means there's more firms out there. And that means that you're diluting those profits amongst more firms. So each individual firm, each new firm can expect to get less. Okay, so that's why there's more research, there's more firms out there, there's more sort of competition for those profits. And so each individual firm gets less. Okay, so that's why that, that marginal benefit curve is decreasing and there's some intersection point. Okay. So that's how, that's kind of how the incentives are set up here. All right. Um, now this, this is, uh, yeah, so, so this is the, the private side. Okay. You can do the, the public side. Okay. Too. You can say, okay, what's the, I, sorry, I shouldn't say public cause that's also be, let's do social, social marginal benefit, um, and social marginal cost. Okay. Now the, the social side is actually simpler. Okay. So if we think about the social marginal benefit, okay, it's going to be, so the social marginal benefit, if you're the social planner, okay, you kind of just, you know, forget about all the, the, the profits and the equilibrium and everything like that. If you're the social planner, like really all you care about is, is this production function. Because remember that this is what the production function sort of reduced back down to. That was our original solo production function. And even though we introduced this notion of having many different firms that A gets split into and then sort of recombined back, it, it, it comes down to this in the end, is that this is your production function, okay? You know, you're, you're allocating these folks, you know, total population between labor and research, okay? Um, and I guess, you know, the researchers have some productivity. Okay, so so you know, as the social planner, you only re re really care about this high level stuff. Okay, and if you think about, you know, if you're the social planner, what's, what's the social marginal benefit of taking a worker and putting them into research? Okay, having an additional researcher. Okay, well, it's still true that they they have some probability success gamma. They they only have a positive effect if they're successful, and that happens with probability gamma. Okay, um, and if they're successful, 
Okay, they're going to push A up. All right? They're going to push A up. All right? And that's that's essentially that's your that's your sort of the marginal product of A, so the derivative of Y with respect to A. Okay? Uh, and then also we need to discount that because that that will last forever. If you increase A today, it's it, it it will increase more in the future, but that that increment sort of is the new baseline. Okay, so that that slice kind in time lasts forever. Okay, so that's why we the same thing we just divide by row to turn it from a a single event into a, a an event that lasts forever. Okay, so that we'll we'll unpack that in a second. Okay, that's your social marginal data event. Okay, and then uh, the social marginal cost. Okay, so that's um, let's see. That's gonna be, you know, you know. So, so the the cost of of putting someone into research is that you don't put them into production. Okay, today, let's say, you can put them back tomorrow, but you don't put them into production today. So, that's like, um, the Y doll. That's the marginal product, which is often similar to the wage. Okay, so this is what the social planner thinks about when they're doing this kind of optimization. Okay, and so, but but actually, you know, when we work through the math here, okay, it ends up being pretty similar, okay, because remember, if we take a derivative of that production function y with respect to a, all, what do you do when you take a derivative? You decrement the thing you're the a by one power, and then you just sort of pop off whatever the exponent was on there. So you you pop off of that exponent one minus alpha, and then you take your original thing, but you lose the power of a. Okay, so that when 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 it, when the function looks like it does over there, that's how you that's the the consequence of taking a derivative is is you get the exponent and you lose one power of a, okay. And I'm gonna write it like that because then it'll it'll neatly cancel on the other side. If you do the same thing on the right hand side, you get a you you get that same exponent because remember a and l both have a one minus alpha exponent, and then here you have y, but then you lose a power of l. Okay, so the good thing though is it, by not writing out everything and just doing it like this, we get the same thing where one minus alpha and y cancel out. Okay, so then we get, you cancel these here, it's hard to cross out a y. Okay, then you're left with just gamma over a is equal to one over l. Okay, um, we're, we're actually almost there. Okay, now, I'll, we'll have to, what we have to do now is get rid of that one over a in the same way we did before. Remember, before we found one over a was n over gamma r. That's still true. Okay, so gamma times n over gamma r is just n over r. Left and on the right is one over p minus r. Remember the same thing. You just sub in for uh, l with you know production, uh, total population net of researchers. Okay. Um, and then finally, we do that same, again, the same thing where you divide by P and so you get SR here and then one over one minus SR here. Okay, because because you go from sort of an aggregate equation to like a share of population equation. Okay, oh, I lost a, I forgot about row. You can't forget about row. Row is actually rather important. Okay, so we're gonna get one over row. Just throw row over in here. Okay, so so row, you know, up here I, I had um where we at here. Uh here, row. You know, so that carries down here. I just happened to forget about it. Okay, but that's important. Okay, so here this is what, what you ultimately get. All right. And if you look at how that compares to I think we can see well, they can't quite see it, but but up top we had the same thing. It's just there's that alpha. The alpha basically is the only difference. Okay, so this, but this is social marginal benefit on the left and social marginal costs here on the right. Okay, the social marginal cost. Okay, it's unfortunate I can't quite get them in here, but if you look at the social marginal cost here, is one over one minus SR. The same thing as private. So, so we, the the production, the the labor production side is actually pretty similar. Okay, it's just on the left hand side we have that extra power of alpha, so that. The private marginal benefit is alpha times the social marginal benefit. So these private firms are not internalizing 
all the benefits. They're only of, of their of their new product. They're only internalizing some fraction alpha. Okay. Uh, and, and essentially, because when other firms come along, they cut into your profits. Okay. So you so you don't really see the full uh, the full effect of the the infinite stream of sort of social surplus that you're producing. Okay. Um, and those future firms don't internalize that either. So, uh, so that's sort of the, the dynamic is that the, the, the private entities only are, are compensated a certain fraction of the social mar marginal benefit. They're facing the same sort of marginal cost situation. And so they're going to underinvest. Okay. So we can draw, we can draw in the same thing because PMC, we just found that private marginal cost is equal to social marginal cost. That's one of our, one of my tests are. And then the private marginal benefit, sorry, the, so the social marginal benefit is going to be some line that's up above, you know, uh, the private. So it's, 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 you know, this bottom line, private marginal benefit is alpha, which is less than one times that social marginal benefit. So it's, it's going to be shifted down from the social. All right. And then we can, that intersection, hence, you know, sort of the standard supply, uh, demand, oh, what is it? The, you know, standard, standard sort of line shifting arguments, you know, if, if that social line is higher, the intersection is going to be farther to the right. Hence this thing, which I'll call like SR hat is going to be higher. Okay. So that's our hat's higher. You, you can, you can do the same thing algebraically, right? If you, if you solve that equation on the left for SR, you're going to get that very SR hat, which is going to be the, yeah, it's going to be N over rho plus n. Okay, and remember the equilibrium SR, which was SR star, was alpha n over rho plus alpha n. Okay. All right, and so, you know, and it's maybe not obvious that SR star is less than SR hat, but if you if you divide by alpha here, you're going to get this. So over alpha plus n. Okay, so you can see here, if you, if you compare these two, okay, it's like it's like the private folk have a higher discount rate, right? So so the, these two things here are the same, except it's like this private uh, calculation has a discount rate of rho over alpha, which is greater than rho because alpha is less than one. Uh, so they have sort of this artificially high discount rate. So it's like you know they they generate some social surplus. Future firms cut into that, okay. And, and it makes it look it's a, because but because it happens in the future, it's sort of like they're discounting the future more than they should. Okay, so these these private firms are too short sighted because they're not internalizing the full future stream of benefits that they produce. Okay, and because they're too short sighted, they do too little research. Okay, um, and, 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 and and you know they're acting like they have a higher discount rate than the social planner than, than is societally optimal. Okay, so. Um, that's sort of the logic, okay? That that's sort of the basic Romer model logic, okay? And here you you know we I, we kind of made things simple, okay? So we get this relatively simple outcome, okay? That just involves sort of the growth rate and and the the discount rate, okay? And then also this alpha term, okay? So, um, but that's that's sort of what you get. So so the the, the prediction though is unambiguously, you know, under investment in research, okay? Um, and you know I said before. We did, we, we said, okay, well, let's say alpha is 35%. Let's say uh, N is 2%. Let's say rho is 5%. Okay. In that case, okay, if we, if we plug those numbers in into the, and, and right, so, so in this case, that gave us 10% for the equilibrium. Okay. If we plug the numbers uh, into the, the social planners problem, okay, N is 2%. Uh, row is 5%. Okay, then we're going to get, well, we're going to get 2% over 7%, okay, which is 2 sevenths, which is, um, what's that going to be? Uh, if you multiply by, it's about, it's a little under 30%, which, like, damn, that's a lot of research. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's the, that's, that's what the model tells you. Okay, and you shouldn't always trust models, but that's what the model tells you, because, so essentially, saying okay, well, let's suppose 
that the model is reasonable. Okay, and the it, it, the model generates its prediction that there should be ten percent research in equilibrium. Okay, so maybe that's too high. Maybe maybe that's high, too high by a factor of two. But even if it's too high by a factor of two, then uh, let's say the model predicted five percent instead, then the social planner might still predict something like fifteen percent. Okay, so whatever the case may be, you know, the, the model is telling us that there's there's an underinvestment. And in this case, they're saying we have we should have three times more research than we do currently. Okay. Um, so that th there's two things I'll, I'll close up um, on regarding this is, well, one is, uh, you know, it, that, that's our star. That's a prediction of a pure free market economy. The, the model says if, the, if we had a pure free market economy, this is what the research share would be. Now, in truth, we we don't, you know, have, we we already subsidize research. Okay, so so um, you know, that and that's not accounted for here. Okay, so that might be misleading us. So, so maybe if if we accounted for the fact that we were subsidizing research, we would change something about these these parameters, and that would give us a different outcome. Okay. Um, the other thing is that you just you, you you know this is a simple model, and the world is extremely complex. Um, and so you can't always take that SR hat saying, oh, well, if I were the social planner, I would invest 30% of research and we'd live in a utopia. Uh, you can't take that at face value all the time because things break down. Okay. In particular, that assumption we made about research, just kind of, you can just scale it up linearly. That probably breaks down. Right? If you triple the amount of research overnight, you're going to get, you know, you get corruption, probably siphoning of funds. You get duplicative research. You'll get people claiming they've invented stuff when they haven't, right? So, so things break down, right? Especially when you push these systems, these models, way past what they're sort of originally designed for, they break down. Okay, so you can't. I wouldn't take this too literally. I would take the notion that there's certainly the possibility of an underinvestment in research seriously, uh, but the specific numbers maybe are are too fantastical really to 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 take literally. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so that's it. I, I think I actually am going to end five minutes early. Um, I've ended late a couple of times in the past, so this is this, this is my attempt at settling the score. Um, you know, uh, so so the the projects. Okay, I hope those are going well. Um, got any questions on that? You know, feel free to email me. Okay, uh, happy to, to to talk about that. Okay, um, but yeah, uh, you know, thanks thanks for a great semester. Um, I know it's been weird been a weird year uh hopefully will you guys some of some of some of you are graduating so hopefully things are back to normal uh either way hopefully they're back to normal next year okay um and uh yeah so good luck with everything